and uh, you see things of a certain size quite easily because they're handy, right? So objects manifest themselves to you as things because they have some relationship to your capacity to use them as tools and that's dependent on your size you have a certain strength and not a different strength you have a certain degree of articulation there's some things you can represent in language so you have limitations that screen out from your consideration all sorts of things and that's bad because for example, before people discovered germs, there was a lot of them zipping about killing people and the fact that we couldn't see them wasn't such a good thing but by the same token, we're also not as overwhelmed with complexity as we might be if we could detect everything and, you know, one of the problems with being connected so much is that it's easy to drown in information and that's rough for information foragers, you can't stay off your damn computer because there's, you know, it opens up your senses far beyond their normal limitations and so where should you stop? well, you don't, you know, you're on the damn thing like a like a pensioner on a slot machine and for many of the same reasons so your body also filters out the world for you and provides you with access to some information and not access to others and then the same thing is the case with your nervous system and I do read, I put the first picture there of the this is the central nervous system that controls voluntary movement, for example I, I put it there because people like to think that th their brain is in their head, but it's, it's a stupid way of thinking about it as far as I'm concerned because you have an awful lot of neurological tissue distributed through your body and like your autonomic nervous system, if I remember correctly, which is mostly distributed through your body, has more neurons in it than your central nervous system and so you, you aren't a brain in a, in a body, you know, your, your, your brain is really, really distributed through your whole body and I think the idea that you have a brain in a body is kind of a holdover from the idea that you have a soul in a body and not that I'm necessarily criticizing that idea, but I think they kind of got grafted onto one another and so, but the problem with that is that it, it and this is that, so it's the soul body, brain body, mind body dichotomy, which I think is the same dichotomy and the problem with that is that it's easy to think of thought as something that's abstracted away from the body and I think that was an enlightenment idea, you know, that, that, that just like the soul shouldn't be contaminated by the demands of the body if you were going to be pure spiritually so your thought shouldn't be contaminated by your subjectivity and your emotions and your motivations and all of that it should, your abstractions should be independent of your subjectivity and rationality and emotion are, are, are construed in that manner as enemies you know, that the, the purpose of rationality is to dispense with the irrationality of emotion and motivation and that's Freud, Freud's idea of the properly functioning ego is something like that too because the id is this place of compulsion and, and drive and the ego has to basically suppress that in the service of the superego there's no idea of integration really in Freud now I don't want to be rough on Freud and I think part of the reason that he thought that way is because the patients he had were precisely those who weren't very well integrated because of their pathological past and so they didn't know how to get those subsystems up into the overarching game and so their only alternative was something like suppression or repression because if you, you know, if you don't know how to be aggressive in a sophisticated way you're still going to be aggressive but you're going to have to inhibit it, control yourself because you can't just be aggressive around people, it just won't go well for you so even if you can't do it in a sophisticated way, you're going to repress it or you're, go or you're going to get in trouble, those are the options so, okay, but if you start thinking about the brain, the nervous system as part of the body as an inseparable part, well then then the function of thinking starts to become something different it's not so much the objective abstract representation of the world which is kind of what you're pursuing if you're a scientist, it's more like it's more like conceptualization of and practice, the pro practice of the proper way of being in the world and I think that's what you're more interested in anyways, I, I don't see how you can't be since you're a living thing <laughs>
and you're, you're overwhelmingly motivated to successfully manifest those actions that a living thing has to manifest in order to continue and it's complicated, like you can boil it down to survival and reproduction, it's a good overarching simplification but there's nothing simple about survival and reproduction I mean, all sorts of complex monsters emerge out of that even simple conceptualization but it's not unreasonable to assume that one of the things that people generally want to do is to continue living in as pain-free manner as possible it's something like that although that's a simplification so now the reason I'm I'm making that case is because the fact that you have a body and yet the fact that you have a nervous system is another set of limitations on how it is that you're going to interact with the world okay so now we've got the nervous system we can go to higher resolution we say well you have a brain and the brain let's see if I can so that's the prefrontal that's the frontal cortex there and that's the temporal cortex there and that's the parietal cortex there and that's the sensory cortex there and these were if I remember properly these were divisions that I think were first well they were first thought through in the late 19th and early, early 20th century um, they're slightly specialized so this cortex back here is, is, does a lot of the elaboration of vision and that one there helps you with your sense of embodiment and your knowledge about where your body actually happens to be localized and then that one helps for, for example in, in some elements of language output and then the frontal cortex especially the prefrontal part which is up here is concerned with the organization and implement the organization of motor action and that's a good way of thinking about it, you've got part of your brain that deals with the sensory world and, and the, in the integration of the sensory world which seems to happen about there where these places meet and the prefrontal cortex it grew out of the motor cortex the motor cortex helps you plan and plan out voluntary actions the prefrontal cortex grew out of that in the course of evolution so you might think well the, there's reflex actions and they happen when something happens to you, you respond and then that elaborates up into the motor system and that enables you to act voluntarily in the world and then that elaborates up into the prefrontal motor system which helps you plan how you might act in the world right, so it's the prefrontal cortex that's the home of let's call it complex, sophisticated, voluntary thought which you could think about as a way of representing the world but which is more accurately a way of generating avatars of yourself in hypothetical worlds to figure out how they would survive if you did implement them into action and so I think that's why so one of the weird things that you discover psychometrically is that there's no correlation between conscientiousness and intelligence and that's a weird one you know because people think about intelligence as planning and forward thinking and all of that but that's also how they think about conscientiousness as planful behavior and, and, and the consideration of future possibilities but intelligence and conscientiousness have zero correlation and so you think, well why is that? well, I guess it has to be that way because you couldn't think abstractly if you were prone to act out what you thought you just go and act it out and that, like, when it, I, I mentioned this to you before when you dream, you're paralyzed and you can take that little part of the brain that produces that paralysis out of a cat or out of a person, but we haven't done it with people out of a cat and then when the cat falls asleep and hits REM sleep it'll run around until it runs into something and then it'll wake up well so the dream thinking is so tightly allied with action that there's no separation between them so there's no real abstraction there if you couldn't abstract you wouldn't be able to think and the fact that you can abstract means that you can separate your thinking from your action so that's why as far as I can tell there's very little correlation between conscientiousness and intelligence it's like it has to be that way because you have to be able to think about things that you wouldn't do if you're going to think so, and in generally we, we think of people who act as soon as they think as impulsive so okay, well so there's a huge part of the brain that's devoted to sensory processing and there's a huge part of the brain that's devoted to planning 
And the whole prefrontal part of the brain is devoted to planning. And that's, and again, so what that indicates is that in large part, as far as your evolved body is concerned, the reason is that you think is so that you can act better. And of course that makes sense. And you can think about memory from that perspective too, because if you think scientifically, you think that your memory of the world is something like an objective record of events, of objective events, but it's really not very much like that at all. And besides, who cares? You don't need an accurate representation of all the facts about this room. In fact, all it would do is weigh you down. Who cares what color the walls are, or what color the ceiling is, or what color the paint is? All of that's not worth remembering. Partly because it has no relationship whatsoever to what you need to do in order to continue to act. And so what you're doing when you remember, as far as I can tell, is that you're mining your experience for information that you can bring forward into the future. It's purely pragmatic.